All right, so we're continuing with talking about work and kinetic energy. So you probably have some sense of what we mean by work, but your colloquial sense is not the same as the technical definition. When we talk about work done on a system, we mean the force, we, we mean technically the force dotted with the, uh, the displacement so that you can have different amounts of work depending on, uh, on the relative um, the relative directions of those two forces. So if you have uh, if you have something acted upon by gravity, so let's say that you have a box and you are going to lift the box up, um, then the force is in this direction. We will use our standard coordinate systems where, this is x and this is y. And then we are going to move the box up. So we will use a displacement of delta x in this direction. Um, and you can see that they have the opposite directions. So um, we're going to call this h y hat. And this is going to be m g y hat, and it's in the negative direction. So then you have work is equal to negative m g h. And if this is your work, now this is saying, this is how much work the system does. So when you, uh, but the work, done on the system is positive. So you have to be careful with signs when you're talking about work. When you are adding energy to a system, you are doing work on it. The work will be positive. And when you are, when the system is doing work, the work is negative. So typically, if we're talking about the work done on a system, we put a negative sign here. And when we are talking about the work done by the system, we have a positive sign. Now, when you're talking about a discrete amount of, when, when you're talking about constant displacements and constant forces, you use this form, F dot dx. Uh, but often we are talking about forces that may change as you move around. Um, it, so they're not in the same direction uh, across the, they're not, F dot dx is not constant as a function of the path. So then you would have to consider, you would have to do this in small pieces and do an integral. When you do that, it's f dot dx instead of f dot delta x. And then here you can see that the work in the work done in a mag, in a gravitational field is mgh. And then you, if you move something of mass m up a distance h, and it is positive. The work done. Uh, on the system is positive, the work done by the system is negative. Okay, so then we can talk about other cases. Um, here, here you can see the more general case where you have some force which may or may not be, which is not necessarily um, parallel or perpendicular to the, um, to the displacement. So as you go along this path from A to B, in general, you have to you would have to consider a small segment of the path dr, and take the dot product of the force over some entire over some small segment, and then integrate over the entire path. Um, the work which is the work done by a constant force um, is so it's f dot dx. That means that if uh, the dot product is zero, no work is done. Um, so a couple of examples, if you are actually in, in the technical definition, for the, using the technical definition of work, if you are holding something upright, um, you are not actually doing work because when you consider F dot dx, if you're just holding something, dx is zero, so the work done is zero. Um, 
in the case, so if you're just holding something, there is no displacement, but you can also get zero work if you are carrying something, but the force, your, your displacement is perpendicular to the force. So the, the work done by gravity in the case that you walk back and forth carrying something is also zero because the displacement is parallel to the ground, but the force is perpendicular. So if your delta x and your force are perpendicular, the work is equal to f dot delta x, but these are perpendicular, so the dot product is zero, so no work is done. Now this does not fit with the intuitive, with like the colloquial definition of work, because colloquially you're doing work if you're carrying something heavy, but no mechanical work is actually done. Um, here you can see a more arbitrary case where you push a lawnmower. When you push a lawnmower, you are pushing down on the handle, um, but the displacement, so your, your force is not exactly parallel to the ground. It is, there's some component perpendicular to the ground. And then the dot product of the force with the displacement is uh, less than the product of the, the magnitude of the force and the displacement. So your actual work done is going to be the force you apply times the displacement times the cosine of the angle done, done between them. Not the amount of energy you expend, but the amount of mechanical work which is done. And here you can see, so we often talk about the path mattering. The amount of work done depends on the way, uh, on the path that you follow. So if you go, um, in, the, in this case, if you're pushing a couch, now it might be that you, uh, that this is a, a very slippery linoleum floor. It's easy to push the couch that way. This is a thick shag carpet, so it's hard to push the, force, the, the, car, the couch this way. So the force in this direction may actually be larger than the force along this direction. So the total amount of work done could be less even if, it takes a long, if, if you take a longer path. But when you're considering how much work is done by moving that couch, you have to consider the path as well as the forces applied. Um, here, if you are talking about a, you know, if you're talking about the work done by gravity, um, let's just do this, um, let's do this as an actual example. So we're going to calculate the work done by gravity either by going along taking a book from here straight there or by taking the book in this direction and then there. We'll call this angle theta. I'm actually going to, in either way, we're going to talk about taking the book to the shelf. So I'm going to switch the order of the arrows on this path. Okay, so now I will call this length and this height, and then this one is h squared plus l squared, the square root of that. Okay, so in both cases, we will give the book book a mass m and now our force we're going to draw our coordinate system x y and now we're going to calculate the force um, in both of following both of these the sorry we're going to calculate the work done in both of these cases so we are going to call the force uh, m g y hat and we're going to put it in the negative direction um, in the first path the one that is highlighted in this yellowish green then we will have the that our delta x is um, equal to L times 
times negative x hat. We move, so this is part one. We move a d distance L dot, uh, LX, negative LX hat. Now, F dot, the work is F dot delta X. This is equal to zero because the force and the displacement are perpendicular. In part two, the work, well, the displacement is H y hat. So work is F dot delta X, which is negative M G H. So this is our total work. Now, that is the work done by the system because the system has energy added to it. So work is done on the system. Now, we're going to consider an alternate path. So now we have a path, so our delta x is equal to, is equal to, we still have the same direction, it's going to be negative L x hat plus h y hat, and then work is equal to F dot delta X, which is equal to I should have yeah, ah, here this I should have put the positive sign there. All right, so now our Delta X is only positive. Ah, oh, no, it should be negative because the force is negative. Then I'm going to have the dot product of the force with this component is zero. So I'm just left with this component and I am left with negative MGH. So in the particular case of gravity acting on, um, acting on something of mass M, the total work done turns out to be the same even though we went two different paths. That's because gravity is a special kind of force called a conservative force. So with gravity, anytime you do that, you are always going to get the same amount of work done by the force. Not all forces are like that, but some are. The forces that we have that are like that, we call conservative, um, and they include things like gravity, the electromagnetic force, um, the spring force actually turns out to be, a spring force turns out to be conservative. And then you have non-conservative forces like friction. All right. All right, so now we move to springs. And I, I can say, when I was an undergraduate taking introductory physics, I remember wondering, why are they telling me about springs? That's a very specific case. I get this is something we can solve, but how is this useful? Because there's not a lot of cases where I'm actually working with a mass on a spring. It turns out, in case you are needing motivation, it turns out that actually nearly every bound system can be modeled as a mass on a spring. So while you might not actually see masses on literal mechanical springs very often, when you are considering, for instance, atoms and molecules, uh, atoms inside molecules, you can approximate them as masses on springs and coupled masses on springs. And there's actually a whole lot of applications of springs. So, uh, so this case, this example, which seems very, very specific and not applicable to many things is actually applicable to nearly everything because it turns out that you can model nearly everything as a mass on a spring. Okay, so when we have a, um, a spring, a mass on a spring, you have the, sp the restoring force. So when you stretch the spring, 
the mass acts to push the, to restore the mass to its equilibrium position. So you have some position where it wants to just sit and rest. When, uh, when you displace it, it wants to go back to the equilibrium position. So if you pull it, it the force is in the opposite of the displacement. Um, when you push it, the force is also in the opposite of the displacement, which is why we note the force is F uh, equals negative K delta X. It's always in the opposite direction of the displacement. Um, so then, if we want to consider the work done, um, we have, we actually have to use the integral form of this. Um, if you are concurrently taking calculus, you can fudge over how we do the derivation for the most part and just use the answer. Um, but if you can follow along, I encourage you to because it's gonna, you're going to build on it later. So we write the force as negative k times the displacement. And I'm actually going to talk about a small segment of displacement. So I'm going to write it as dx instead of delta x. It's just a little tiny chunk of displacement. And then our, um, our sorry, we're going to, actually, here I should have the delta x. I'm going to write, I'm going to use, so delta x, and then we have our displacement is going to be a small chunk, just a little bit of the displacement. So I'll write that as d delta x. Um, now, I can take the dot product of this, and I get that the work is equal to k delta x d delta x. Now, the integral is the area under a curve. In the case of a spring, our force is linear, so it looks like this. Actually, here I'm just drawing the magnitude of the force, so I should not have the vector sign over this. Just a straight line. Um, and the, so the area under the curve is going to be k delta x. That's the, height, the width. And the height is k delta x. So it's k delta x squared divided by 2 because it's a triangle. And um, if you can do, if you already know how to integrate, you can see very simply that the integral is, that's the same thing you get if you integrate analytically. Now, you could put a constant here if you're, if you're taking calculus, you were taught to rigorously always say plus a constant. We wrap that into the definition of energy where it turns out that your zero point for energy is arbitrary. So by convention, we usually set that constant to zero simply because it makes the, it makes the equations a lot simpler. OK. So that is qualitatively what's going, that's how much work is done by a spring. Negative k, well, negative k times the displacement squared divided by 2. And you have to think carefully about that sign for whether you're talking about work being done on a system or work being done by a system. When a, a system does work, it loses energy. When a system has work done on it, it gains energy. Okay, and this is just, uh, this is the same, uh, uh, they put the negative sign so they got the slope correct. I just kept a, con a positive K. Okay. All right, now conservation of energy. So um, often you can use conservation of energy to solve problems. When we were using the kinematic equations a few chapters back, um, you had to figure out the trajectory of something for all time. And it turns out that with energy conservation, in the cases where you have energy conserved, you don't need to know its trajectory for all time. You can just look at the two endpoints. So this is a much easier way of solving many problems. Um, 
my tagline is a good physicist is a lazy physicist. So you want to look at the problem and see if there's if you have to work any harder. You don't work any harder than you have to. Physics is already hard enough. Don't torture yourself by making the equations excessively complicated. So um, here, what you can use, um, this is you have a frictionless track for a toy car that has a loop-de-loop -loop in it. How high does the car have to start so that it can go around the loop without falling off? All right. Now, we want to have, um, at the very beginning, so we then, um, we haven't yet introduced, when, when you talk about the work done by gravitational energy, because it is one of these conservative forces, it is, you can keep the energy, so it's something called potential energy. So up here, if you have, and it turns out that when you have conservation of energy, you have the potential energy plus the kinetic energy is constant. So we usually write the initial kinetic energy, the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. Um, and so if you know uh, the initial kinetic energy and the, um, if you know most of these, you can get the rest of it. All right, so here I can already tell you because it tells us that the velocity is zero. We have a kinetic energy, which I haven't defined yet. Kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the velocity squared. So our kinetic, our initial kinetic energy is equal to zero because it tells us that the, um, that the particle starts with a velocity of zero. And then our initial potential energy is mgy initial. Okay, now what we need is we need the, the car to end up with, um, if it has a force, if you draw a, the free body diagram at the second point here, um, you have, and po you potentially have a normal force from the, um, from the, from the track pushing down on the car, and you also have gravity, and those are the two forces that you have acting on it. At the point that, uh, now the you know that the, um, the acceleration is equal to V squared over R if the car is going exactly in, cir in a circular direction. Um, so you can write M A squared equals M V squared over R. At the point that... Uh, at exactly the point where uh, the car is going as slow as possible without falling off, then you, uh, you have no normal force and your acceleration is going to be exactly gravity. So gravity is going to fall, to cause it to fall in the direction that it, it, directly towards the center so that the car stays moving in the loop. We can use this equation to figure out what the velocity is. I have m's everywhere, but I don't need those m's to figure out what the velocity is. So I get that v squared equals gr, or v equals the square root of gr. Now, at that point, my final kinetic energy is equal to one half m v squared, so one half m v r, and my potential energy, and here this, this problem uses a capital R, so I'm going to use a capital R, my potential energy is equal to twice the radius, so is, my height is twice the radius, so I have a potential energy of mg 
times 2r. So uh, then how high does this have to be? I can write initial, connect, initial energy equals final energy. So I have m g y initial equals one half m g r plus two m g r. I have a lot of cancellations I can make. I have an m in every term. I have a g in every term. So here, I am left with y initial equals 2 plus 1, 2.5 r. So I have to start at least 2 and a half times the radius, so a about yay high if this picture is drawn to scale. A note that I could do that, the only time I had to consider uh, I could use conservation of energy, except I had to know that uh, I had to know what the acceleration is for an object moving exactly in a circle. Now, I want to point out this is why physics gets tricky, is because a lot of times it's cumulative. You have to take something that you learned a few chapters back and apply it in a different problem. So. Otherwise, you just do kinetic energy, you do energy conservation and plug away. The hard part about this type of problem is that you have to write your, um, as when we were doing kinematic problems, you have to write down the problem correctly, mathematically. So we're going to follow more or less, we're going to follow a similar procedure. I, I recommend always drawing a picture um, and then considering what you have to um, Start writing down what your equations are telling you. What, write down when you know variables, like here we knew the initial velocity was zero. Write that down. Um, write down equations which might apply. And then go from there and see if you have an opportunity to solve the problem. OK, so now we can consider another case. Uh, this is a lovely one. So uh, you want to consider we have a bullet flying in, uh, um, we have a bullet that hits a board. It, uh, the board rubs against the floor. And then you, uh, then the boards do work so the bullet loses kinetic energy. So this is uh, a nice one because again, this, has, this requires that you put together a lot of different parts that you've learned already. Um, when we consider the bullet, we are considering it to have no forces acting on it. It technically has gravity, but it's traveling so quickly that uh, th this process is so fast that the f effect of gravity on the bullet is going to be negligible. Now, here we have, we consider this to be, now here you have only the bullet moving, but here you have the bullet and the board moving once the bullet strikes the board. So, here, um, we have the normal force, and we have gravity. And then we have friction, and friction is going to act in this direction because it is going to counteract motion. We have no net motion in the y direction, so I can say, I can tell you that friction, and ah, I'm going to draw my coordinate system here. I have x, I have y, and my uh, force of friction is going to be negative mu sub k, because we are talking about the board actually moving, times the normal force, except the normal force has to, um, has to equal the weight. Now, this is the weight of the bullet, and I'll just put... Uh, we need, it matters, we're going to put the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the board combined times G. So, um, I now have the, let's see, so we have initially 
the kinetic energy is one half m v initial squared. Our potential energy is equal to zero. And then we have our final kinetic energy is equal to zero because the board stops. Now we have, do not have potential energy, we have work done. Um, so we're going to use a slightly modified version. We have kinetic energy plus potential energy plus work done equals initial equals the same thing final. Okay, so now we don't really have potential energy in either case, but we're going to consider the work done on the, um, the work the top board does on the bottom board. So but then our work final is going to be force of friction times delta x. And this is taking energy away from the, the combined bullet board. Um, and it has to take away, the amount of energy it has to take away is exactly equal to the initial kinetic energy. So we have one half m, little m, vi squared equals mu sub k, little m plus big M, g delta x. So here, this is actually a way that you can measure the velocity of the bullet of a bullet by shooting it into a board and seeing how far the board goes. Uh, in this case, we're given the velocity of the bullet, so we can ask how, uh, how far does it travel. And if we wanted to solve for that, it is going to travel this far. Now we should double check units at mu sub k is unitless. This has units of mass and that has units of mass. Um, so if I, so I have kilograms meters squared per second squared divided by kilogram meters per second squared and here I can cancel out my units just as if I were working with an algebraic equation. And I am left with units of meters, which is good. Because a distance should have units of meters. So that is how you can use energy conservation to Solve it. You could ask different variations on this problem. How far does the, you're given the speed, how far does the, um, does the board bullet system travel? You're given the, how far it travels in the coefficient of kinetic friction. How, uh, how fast was the bullet going? It's probably easier to measure a distance than a speed of a bullet that's going 335 meters per second. So you can actually use this to measure how fast a bullet travels. And before we had all the fancy equipment, I think it's, it's easy for younger people to take, and take this for granted. But you know, we didn't always have fancy electronics um, measuring how fast a, measuring a bullet going at 335 meters per second directly is really rather hard if you don't have fancy um, computers and cameras. All right, power is the amount of energy transferred per unit time. So it is, if you are comfortable with calculus already, it is the time derivative of energy. 
we approximate it in many cases as the change in energy per unit time. Note that you can also have average power. Um, if you have, you know, you're often considering some process that changes, where there's some changes as a function of time, and you care about the average power, you would then use this version of the, of the of power. Okay, so what is the power expended in doing 10 pull-ups in 10 seconds? Well, the actual work done, if you go back to where you, you started, then um, the work done is zero because you go back to where you started, um, in which case the energy is zero, so the power is zero. But you could calculate um, the average, um, if you wanted to con calculate the average magnitude of the power, that's a slightly different problem. But because you end up back where you started, the net work is zero, so the net power is zero. All right, now, what is the power needed to move a car up a hill at constant speed? So, the work is equal to F dot delta X, and then power is the magnitude of the work per unit time. So this is the force. Uh, ah, here I made a mistake. I have vectors here. Work is a scalar, not a vector. So here I have, and I got tripped up when I went to write power because power is not a vector. So I have to delete my arrow over work. The work is F dot delta X. The power is work divided by time. F dot delta X over T. Now, the force in this case, let's, so this is, let's just call this theta and let's not worry about the 15% grade. Um, the force here, our delta x is, so our force is going to be negative m g y hat and our velocity if i use our standard coordinate system x y now our velocity is the magnitude of the velocity and then cosine theta x hat, so that most, if theta is zero, all of the, um, all of the velocity is in the x hat direction, plus magnitude of the velocity, sine theta y hat. So the velocity dotted with the force, I can write this as f dot v, so the velocity dotted with the force is going to give me m g v sine theta. Now we consider this um, this sine. This is how much the um, how much sis work the the system does. The, the work that the system that has to be done on the system has the opposite sign, so that your power is mgv sine theta. So the steeper the hill, the more power you have to have to go up the hill with the same velocity.
So that took putting together several different things. And that's a theme. Now that we're getting further in, further into the book, you have to put several things together to solve the problems. Examples. Well, we already walked through this one. Here you have, uh, you're pushing a box up an inclined plane. How much work are you, work do you do? So here, you're, we're going to use our inclined plane coordinate system, x, y, and then the, um, so if you are pushing, the force from you pushing directly is, so you have to consider the net force, you're also acting against gravity. Gravity acts in this direction. So if I, uh, if I ask, I can ask a bunch of different questions on this one. So here you can actually consider two different, um, two different contributions of work. Um, you can have the work which was done by friction, um, and you can have the work which is done by gravity. So here, the normal force is in this direction. I think we've done this one now enough times that I can probably skip through uh, at least some of the steps. Um, so we have, uh, we have friction is equal to the mu sub kinetic because you are moving in the direction of, um, because you're moving, it's gonna be in the negative x hat direction. Um, and then the component of gravity, which is, um, which is, perpendicular to the, um, to the surface, we'll call this guy theta, and then you have mg sine, oh, let's see, cosine theta, because you have a larger normal force if the box is flat. All right, that's, and then I drop my X hat. I need my X hat here. Um, and then you have, we can write delta X is equal to, uh, we will say that you, that this is L and this is H. So delta x is going to be L x hat. Ah, no. In the coordinate system that I have, delta x is the square root of L squared plus H squared. So that is my x hat in this coordinate system. And then, uh, I can write gravity, the, uh, the weight, um, so the force due to gravity is equal to mg cosine theta y hat plus sine theta x hat. So, the work done by pushing the box up um, due to friction is equal to mu k m g cosine theta 
delta x. The work done by gravity is equal to m g cosine theta times l squared plus h squared. Now, ah, so here, sorry, sine theta. Not cosine theta, sine theta. Because it's this, that, that. Okay, now I can write by the definition of sine theta, sine theta is h over the square root of l squared plus h squared. So this simplifies to m g h. So the work done by gravity is just m g h. The work done due to friction is UK mg cosine theta times the distance traveled. All right. Let me erase this and then we can move on to the next example. You pull a child in a wagon, uh, a distance of 30 meters. How much do you, work do you do? So now, F dot delta X is going to be 50 newtons times 30 meters. And then we want cosine 30 degrees. So the dot product um, is, so this is F, the magnitude of F times the magnitude of delta X times the cosine of the angle between them. So a simple problem like this is plug and chug. All right, in this problem, how much work is done by the tension and uh, by the tension in the string and by friction? So here, if we, well, it depends a little bit on what exactly is F. So in the problem that is in the textbook, this says, suppose the ski patrol lowers a, uh, lowers a rescue sled and victim, it gives a mass, um, at a constant speed as shown below, um, how much work is done by the sled um, as it moves along the hill, how much work is done by the rope in, this, in the sled, on the sled in this distance, um, how much work is done by friction, how much done work is done by the, the rope, and how, what is the work done by the gravitational force on the sled. So in these cases, you would do similar to what we did before. Um, we are going to use our in-kind plane coordinate system with x lined up along the slope. And then um, the, your delta x you're lowering the sled in this case. So delta x is going to be um, in the negative x hat direction. Um, the gravitational force is the magnitude cosine theta y hat in the negative direction and then minus 
W sine theta in the x hat direction. Um, so, and then you can write friction is going to be the normal force times the coefficient of kinetic friction. And this is going to be in the positive x direction. So mu sub k w cosine theta and then x hat, and it's in the positive direction. So how much work is done by the, the string? Well, it's going to depend on what that, so you have to have the, it's going to depend on the tension in the string. Um, and that tension is slowing the skier down as well as, now you're not given, I think you're, you're not given the acceleration. So you'd, you'd have to work, it's a constant speed. So sorry, it's a constant speed. So you're given that the acceleration is zero. So then um, you are given, so the tension is going to be the magnitude of the tension in the x hat direction. So if the net force is zero, then um, T plus mu sub k w cosine theta is equal to W sine theta. That doesn't show up through the picture. So this has to be equal to W sine theta. Um, and that tells you the total magnitude of the tension and the friction. Um, and then if you do the work done by gravity, it is this dot that. So work done by gravity is W delta x cosine theta. Work done by the tension in the string. Now let's do friction first. Work done by friction is negative mu sub k w cosine theta. Work done by tension is w sine theta minus mu sub k w cosine theta. And then that dotted with delta x. Ah, I dropped my delta x here. I'm going to rewrite that. Now, note that if you add this all up together, you should get cancellations. Okay, so here's how you get each of the different parts. And then what is the total work done? Um, so the easiest thing to do is say that the um, work done by the tension is, and the friction is equal. It, these two parts cancel out, um, and the total work is going to be W delta X cosine theta plus W delta X sine theta. All right. So hopefully you're getting a flavor. You just use your conservation. Um, you use conservation laws and you use the definition of force. One thing that can happen is you guys learn more is that you lose the um, 
the definitions, the fundamental de definitions, force equal work equals force dot delta x, that will get a little bit rustier. Okay, so here, in this case, actually, if you had friction, you would not be able to calculate this. Um, because you don't have friction, you can calculate... Um, you can calculate a lot more. This one is asking you, um, when released, a 100 gram block slides down the path shown below, reaching the bottom at a speed of four meters per second. How much work does friction do? Okay, it's released so at rest. So here we can use energy conservation. The uh, initial kinetic energy from the wording in the problem is equal to zero. The initial potential energy is equal to mgh, where h is two meters. Here I'm keeping everything symbolic until the very end. At the end, the final kinetic energy is one half mv final squared, where v final is four meters per second. And then um, I have, uh, and this says, uh, this, we are also given in the problem that M equals 0.1 kilograms. Note that I'm converting it to kilograms to SI units as I write it down, so I don't ever even work with non-SI units. And then here I'm going to have the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy um, equals the final kinetic energy plus the final potential, potential energy plus the work which was done. So this is asking us how much work is done. This term is zero and this term is zero. So the initial potential energy minus the final kinetic energy equals the work which was done. Now, now I can put numbers in. So my initial potential energy was 0.1 times 9.8 times 2 meters minus my kinetic energy, one-half times 0 0.1 times 16. And this has units of joules. This is 0 0.8 times 2 is 1.96 minus 0 0.08. So this is equal to 1.88 joules. Okay. We'll just do a couple more examples. Here, you're given the force versus x, and you can actually integrate under the curve here. So what is the work? This problem, exercise 101, this is one of the challenge problems. Find the work done by this particle as it moves from x equals 1 to x equals 5. So here, x equals 1, x equals 5. So here, I can just graphically calculate the area and... 
This segment is 1 times 4, so this is 4 newton meters. This is 1 times 4 times 1 half. Let me get that lined up a little bit better. So 1, the base is 1, the height is 4, so that's 2 newton meters. And then here we have 2 by 4 by 1 half or 4 newton meters. A newton meter is also equal to a joule. This is 1 by negative 2 by half or negative 1. Let me draw an arrow because it's getting messy negative one newton meters. So I can add all of that up. This is 10 newton meters minus nine, it, minus one is nine newton meters. So when you're given something like that, the easiest way is just to calculate the area under the curve. All right, and with that, we're gonna close this chapter. See you guys for the next one.